welcome. We especially would like to welcome the, the president of the university that is hosting together with the anti-poverty platform this uh, evening with you all that are representing unions in St. Martin. I would like to especially welcome the Minister of Youth. He has a very long title, Education, Culture, Youth and Sports. But tonight he is here actually as Minister for the Youth. And um, next to him we have uh, the Secretary General, Acting Secretary General of the Ministry and also the one that was heading the Department of Youth in the Ministry. Not very difficult to introduce. You all know her, the president of the Windward Island Chamber of Labor Unions, Claire Elshot. And then we have for you the keynote speaker of tonight, who is Mr. Nils Kastberg. I first would like to uh, welcome you all and thank you for coming and for sharing with us tonight. I see you all have all brought already your notes, pads, and your pens, which is very useful for what we will be getting tonight. We will be recording this for those that could not reach for tonight. So that is for them also actually to get the message that we would like to share. So as a small introduction, let me tell you how come we and the university are working together and what is it that we are going to do during this week that we have our consultant with us. It is that we have embarked on a project to do some more research in the reality of our children, our youth, and our adolescents here in St. Martin, and where we would like to, together with parents, with the families, inform them and educate them so that they also can contribute to the development of St. Martin. After the hurricane, a lot of challenges, so we want to start with that experience to build back better and stronger is not only to build back the blocks, it's also to build back the people to be more resilient. And we would like to give our two cents to that. And we are very fortunate that the university also wants to support us with their institution in the research. So let me introduce to you Dr. Carmona Baez, who is the president of the university to welcome you tonight. Uh, welcome all. For those of you who have never met before, uh, welcome to the University uh, of St. Martin. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Antonio Carmona Baez. I am here together with the Dean of Academics, Dr. Rolinda Carter. And we both came on board in May 2017. In May, it will be a year since we've uh, been here. And uh, we've had the, uh, we have the mandate to rebuild the university. When people think about the university, they think about those young people going to get the degree so that they could get a job, and that's it. And of course, that's a very important part of uh, the university. But another very important part is the community that the university, sorry, the service that the uh, university can give to the community. Uh, by informing the community, by creating that space for critical thinking. Uh, and research is another component, a very important uh, action that takes place at the university. But all of these three things combined together, the teaching, the research, and the service to the community, uh, all has to be geared uh, towards uh, that vision that we have for the country, for the island, and also for the region. What can we mean for St. Martin? What can we do for St. Martin? Where do we want to be uh, in 10 years from now? And how do we want to improve our social conditions? Uh, the last research that we participated in was how healthy is St. Martin? We did that together with the north side uh, of the island with the collectivity 
and other uh, universities. The University of the Virgin Islands was also involved. Uh, and we look forward uh, to embarking upon this new venture of looking at uh, our social economic condition and development on the island. And I'm very proud to say that uh, we are going to be working together closely with the St. Martin Anti-Poverty Platform. And uh, I would just uh, say that I'm very happy that the platform, uh, of course, together with the unions uh, and the communities of faith, uh, have worked together in order to invite uh, Mr. Niels Kasberg uh, to talk to us uh, about what we're going. I'd also like to thank the Ministry uh, uh, of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports uh, also for opening up the doors uh, today and uh, helping us and collaborating uh, to get our goals accomplished. Well, I hope you all enjoy the evening and thank you very much, Raymond, for this opportunity. Brothers and sisters of the Workers' Organization, we have the honor to have in our midst tonight also the Honorable Minister Wycliffe Smith and the SG and also our consultant, Mr. Niels Kasper, who arrived on the island yesterday from Miami. So welcome to all of you together with the Dean of the University. Okay, the St. Martin Anti-Poverty Platform is a collaboration in a initiated in 2011 between the Windward Islands Chamber of Labor Unions, the St. Martin Seniors and Pensioners Association, and the St. Martin United NGO Federation. We are all non-profit organizations registered in St. Martin with the aim to protect the rights to an adequate standard of living and all other human rights of the families and members of the, our affiliated organizations in particular, and the people in St. Martin in general. Okay? In St. Martin, the anti-poverty platform promotes the eradication of poverty, not the alleviation, but the eradication of poverty, and the full realization of the rights to development of the people of the island through collaboration in research, information se sessions, lectures, seminars, and workshops, press releases, and press conferences, and in cooperation with grassroots organizations and faith-based organizations. And that's why I am proud to also say that the University of St. Martin have agreed to enter into a friendly partnership with the St. Martin Anti-Poverty Platform for the collaboration in the areas of research, community service, informational services, and the development of public policy in the area of poverty eradication, labor, and the treatment of the social economical inequity on St. Martin and in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So to conduct and to be able to set up this project, we have none other than our former director of UNICEF, Caribbean and Latin America, Niels Casper. We are very thankful to this gentleman who is a consultant and has a very busy schedule that he was able to grace our shores once again with his knowledge and be here to share it through, during the period of this week with different groups. So tonight is the first group, and this is the group where the workers' organization and their families will be represented. So sit back and pay keen attention to what he has to share. And we would like to extend a word of thanks also to Mr. Casper for his cooperation on this field. I was asked to give a short address on a very important matter. The topic given, this very long topic, the importance 
of the involvement of the working class and their families in the realization of the rights of the child. Long topic, but we'll let's, let's consider it for a moment. The foundation of any society is the family. The family unit knits together the social fabric of our community, intertwining the principles and values of our ancestors with the lessons learned from our parents and decorated with the wonderful colors of our youth. Children are instinctively vibrant and playful, seeking pleasure and comfort in every moment. They're not born with the knowledge of right or wrong, good or bad. They just know what makes them happy. And if they're not happy, someone will hear their cries about it. Basically, we want to raise happy children who will become positive, contributing members of our society. UNICEF has articulated the basic rights of the child by identifying what measures must be taken by adults, by parents, by the elders, by leaders, and by the governments to safeguard those rights to be happy and to be productive. And so as Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, a few months ago, I signed a memorandum of understanding on behalf of country St. Martin, along with the other countries within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, to uphold, to promote, and to protect the international rights of the child. However, as you know, government cannot do this work alone. To ensure that children are loved and that they're fed and that they're sheltered, cared for and educated and safe from harm requires the keen attention of loving parents. There is a saying, and I quote, the best thing that you can give your child or your children is T-I-M-E, time. And this is a mantra that I fully support. I know the struggles of the working class because I grew up in a home where things were not always easy. Yet, no matter what we had or what we lacked, as children, we were guaranteed a show of affection and some attention from our parents at some point during the day. I carried that heritage forward when raising my own children. And now, I'm interacting with my grandchildren. Life does get busy. And work may never seem to end. But we must pause to let those for whom we are working to provide know, without a shadow of a doubt, that they are the ones that matter most. I understand that in a difficult economy where persons work two and three jobs to make ends meet, there may not seem to be enough hours in the day. But if we could only do the following three things for ourselves and for our families, these three, th three things would make a big difference. Number one, and they're not big things to do. Number one, wake up, give thanks for life, and make up your bed. In so doing, you would have communed with the master of the universe and accomplished an earthly task already for the day, setting a good example for your children to follow. Number two, spend three to five minutes speaking directly, meaning face to face, not via text or phone, with each member of your household at some point during the day. 
your spouse, your child, and any other loved one living with you will certainly remember those conversations and they will certainly cherish them. You never know when that may have been your last conversation. So end it positively. And number three, remember that as, a, as important as it is to earn an honest living, it is more important how you spend it with whom and with whom you share it. The good book says, what does it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I do not know a parent who loved their child that passed away or turned to drugs or to crime, who would not have exchanged their net worth for the wholesome life of their offspring. All luxuries in the world fall short of the assurance of a parent's time and a parent's love. So three th simple things. Wake up, give thanks for life, and make up your own bed. Number two, spend three to five minutes each day talking face to face with your child or with a loved one in your home. And three, remember that as important as it, is, as it is to earn a living, it is more important how you spend it and with whom you share it. I encourage you, therefore, to remember that your employment is contracted, but parenthood is for a real lifetime. Invest your time in your children wisely, for they will be the true product of your life's work. Your children are your legacy. Show up for school meetings. Check up on their friendships. Keep in touch with their activities and be their number one fan. It is possible, ladies and gentlemen, for St. Martin to realize the international rights of the child, but only with the family unit as a foundation and you parents as the cornerstone. So God bless you and may God bless our families. This morning we were talking uh, with the staff of the university about uh, what is the real sovereignty of St. Martin. Hmm? What is it, what's the real sovereignty? And the reflection we were making was that it's not the harbor, it's not the Bay of Phillipsburg, it's not your nice hills. If I was, if I had the power to make all of you disappear in the island, thank God I don't have that power. But if I was to do that, St. Martin would cease to exist. So what gives the real sovereignty to St. Martin is each of you. And it's the combined intelligence of each of you. Now, there are some basic things that we need to be very aware of. A country like Guatemala throws away approximately 49% of its intellectual capacity. Literally. 49% of the population in Guatemala suffer from something that's called chronic undernutrition. This starts during the pregnancy. So many of the children, over one in every five children, more than that, are born to a teenage mother who very often was sexually abused by somebody in the family environment and who is victimized three times. Firstly, becoming pregnant too early for her biological body. Secondly, victimized 
because everybody is looking at her as if she is the problem. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, because the injustice continues there. Whoever was abusing her continues being present there. And he has no problem, but she's the one carrying all the burdens. Now, not all the cases are like that, but the majority of the cases are like that. And that anguish affects the nutritional situation of the mother. So that affects the growth of the brain. So at the moment of birth of the baby, you have a baby, if you took an x-ray of the brain, of the head, of a baby that was born from a mother with good nutritional level, and compare it with the baby of a mother that has been living through all this anguish, you will see that the brain has shrunk, much smaller than the actual head. Now, in spite of that very dramatic situation, it could still be resolved within 24 to 36 months if the mother is able to breastfeed and if the baby is able and child as it starts growing receives in time support. If not, there will be permanent brain damage. It's a perfectly wonderful child that will not have the ability of initiative, will lack a lot of creativity, will repeat first grade probably two, three times, has great difficulties memorizing, will be a very good worker, but only as long as it's repetitive. Don't bring in any element, new element, or don't say, oh, come and do this now. No, you need to let them continue operating in what they have become used to. It's not their fault. It's a whole long line of adults that fail that young mother and that fail that child when it came. And the state has nine months notification that a baby is coming. It's not like a hurricane that comes with such a short notification. A baby gives nine months of notification it is coming, and still it seems we are not able to be ready. Now, why do I go into this level of detail? Because <clears throat> in the Caribbean, it's not always necessarily um, chronic undernutrition that is your gravest problem. But we do have a problem with low IQ in many situations. And those students, those children, are discriminated against. And the last ones that should be discriminated are these students. Hmm? They are the ones that actually should be most supported and helped. Because many of us who should have been involved in trying to reach them in time, didn't arrive in time. Hmm? And we need to make sure that they are provided the support that they need. Now, I mention this because one of the goals that all the governments of the world, including St. Martin, have agreed to for year 2030 is no one left behind. No one left behind. Now, when you hear very often the heads of organizations, whether it is UNICEF or whether it is a governmental entity or whatever, they usually tell you how many they are reaching. Oh, we now reach 92% of the children, etc., etc. But what we need more than ever is to know whom are we not reaching. Who is it we are not seeing? Hmm? Because exclusion operates because we are blind sometimes to certain things that happen around us. Mental conditions and syndromes 
are on the rise. We have seen a great increase in the number of autistic children. Autistic children basically have, generally speaking, uh, the knowledge part of the brain functioning relatively well, but not just like with any typical child. They can be very intelligent or less so, but it's not connected with the emotional part. So uh, an autistic child needs to learn over the years that if I hit you in the finger, it will hurt you. He cannot feel it because that part is not connected. I don't know if you have seen a child with Down syndrome. A child with Down syndrome is exactly the opposite. They are super bright when it comes to the emotional intelligence. Hmm? Emotionally, you see them and you become happy. Hmm? But that part is not well connected with the knowledge part. So they need to be extra protected because they could be abused. Hmm? And they are much more exposed to abuse than others. Hmm? Just learning about all these conditions so that we don't exclude is very important. Otherwise, we will exclude them from development. And the reality is there are 300 million people around the world living with mental conditions and syndromes who are systematically discriminated against. Hmm? In many countries, they are hidden at home. In other countries, Western countries in particular, instead of giving them half an hour of love when they have a tantrum, they give them an injection or a pill, which gradually destroys their nervous system. Hmm? How come we're doing? I'm giving you these two examples because I think it's important to gradually generate knowledge around whom are we systematically discriminating. It was impossible to get in the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000 indicators around chronic undernutrition because the politicians felt that it was easier to deal with the acute malnutrition, which is correct. The acute malnutrition, you can deliver food and after a few months you can overcome the situation. I remember arriving in Thailand, 1980s, and the, the acute malnutrition was over 11%. Extremely, extremely high. The reason was actually because many had jumped into the refugee camp and were not officially counted. So there were like 35,000 in a refugee camp with 75,000. In reality, there were more like 110,000. So the food had to be split between all of them. Hmm? Food was delivered for 75,000, but the actual number was way over 110,000. So we introduced a number of measures, and within 14, 15 months, we had been able to get it down to 2.5%. So acute malnutrition, you can resolve much quicker. But chronic undernutrition takes much longer. It takes much longer to generate knowledge, and it takes years to recuperate the child, and it needs to be done between zero and three years of age. All of you, this is an interesting piece of information. All of you grew 77 centimeters from your age of three until your present age. 77 centimeters. We all grow from the age of three until we are adult. We grow 77 centimeters. So what's missing in your height has to do, we obviously all have genetic differences in terms of the height, but in the case of Guatemala, women have an average of 15 centimeters less of height, and that has to do with stunting during, after birth, during the first year. So the 15 centimeters that are missing was because they grew 15 centimeters less between zero and three. 
we need to continue generating knowledge around these issues. Now, we are gathered here with leaders of trade unions, and you wonder, well, what is, how is this related hmm, to the work? Firstly, I used to myself be part of a labor union in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden when I was working there, and obviously we want to concentrate on protecting the rights of workers. Hmm? And in fact, those persons of faith can easily go into James and read chapter 5. That's the trade union rallying call. Uh, if you are interested in reading something that is 2,000 years old. And there are many other references also about the importance of standing up for the rights of workers. Now the question and the challenge for the trade unions, the labor unions today, hmm, is will we only focus on the monetary part or will we look at the entire package of what it means to be a strong family? Because the average time that a mother is looking into her daughter or son's eye today in a very good family is around 11 minutes a day. They might spend hours behind a television or a cell phone or other things, but the time that they spend, quality time that they spend looking at each other is reducing. And a lot of this time is not used for building up the child. It's actually, what are you up to? What have you been doing? Hmm? Instead of the type of eye contact that helps build the esteem and the self-esteem of the child. And part of this has to do with the entire package of time for the family and for the family relationship. And I would like to encourage the labor unions hmm, and the leaders of workers to be looking at this entire package of what time is spent with the family. You know, <clears throat> some workers only have two weeks a year of leave. That's not decent. Hmm? And if, if you are faith-based, it's not even biblical. <laughs> you know? If you look at the holidays that they had 3,000 years ago, or even 2,000 years ago, Hmm? They had, obviously, the Sundays. Then they had, every seven years, they had a year free. Because they were agriculture-based. And, you know, every seventh year they were free because they had to leave, you know, the, the land to recuperate. If you translated that to a wage economy that is equivalent of having your Saturday free. And then, every 50th year, you were free again. So you had two years, consecutive years, uh, free. The 49th and the 50th. That 50th year is equivalent to one week's leave every year. Hmm? Because you have 52 weeks in a year. Hmm? So that's one week's sleep. And then you had all the religious holidays. And you had at least three where you were free one week. So four weeks leave plus Saturday plus Sunday. If you want to go back to examples 2,000 years old. Anyway, I'm not going to say you have to follow that model. But I still would like to leave with you the importance of looking at the entire package of the worker's family. Because if we don't look at the entire package of the quality time hmm, that you can spend with your child, you might have a little bit more income, perhaps a few more dollars a day, but what are you losing in terms of the quality 
of time with your child. And I think we need to look at how we promote something that is much bigger. And I started off by talking about what is the real sovereignty of St. Martin. The real sovereignty of St. Martin is how much you have in your head, each of you. That's the collective richness of St. Martin. That has elements such as what I talked about, like chronic undernutrition, important to make sure we don't have that, make sure we have the best possible IQ for every child that requires a certain level of nutrition. There are a number of factors that we need to look into. But then the emotional well-being, which cannot be replaced by anything that you go and buy in the supermarket around the corner. And that quality of time, how much value are we going to give that in the next trade negotiations? And wouldn't it be important to start counting that, that for what it's really worth? As this platform looks at what can we do to improve things for the children and the youth of St. Martin, I think it's very important that we also value these aspects. Because increasingly, the alienation, the sense of exclusion, the sense of lack of purpose in life, all of these is leading to very, very difficult situations. Now, I think that every family has a bank account of good memories. If that bank account has very few memories, you have a problem. It's between zero and 10 that you need to build that bank account of memories. Because when your child is 10, 11, 12, if that is when you want to start looking at her in the eye and want her attention, I can assure you, you're arriving 10 years late. You should have started when she was a baby, he was a baby, and you could hold her on your laps and look into her eye, you know. And if you build between zero and 10 all that bank of good memories, when they start running away with their friends and so on, they will always remember. On Sunday, I want to have dinner with mom, whatever. Hmm? They will come back because that bank of memory is so important. But if that bank of memory is down to zero or below zero, you know, then how are you going to keep your child? So as you get involved into building back better after Irma and after Maria. That has to include these questions of values, the questions of the family time. And I hope as trade unions, you can look at that entire package because who is in the best position to negotiate that with those that employ workers, if not you? You are the ones that need to be looking at the total package for the whole family, not just the salary envelope. Look at the whole family package. And that will be one contribution to make St. Martin a much stronger country. Thank you. For the workers' union, our name, uh, the union I'm on is St. Martin Communication Union. I have a question for you. How, is, how can we as trade unionists, because we don't only negotiate money, huh? but look at it, many in the workforce, we have many ladies, many mothers. Recently, we have one very important topic that he was speaking about, which is maternity leave, increasing it to 18, as the ILO has established, and paternity leave. Now, in St. Martin, we have legislation, and we have set groups that, it, that things have to go through. For example, they have to go for Senate ad for advice, council of ministers, parliamentarian. Now, it is very difficult for us as trade unionists to reach where we can say 
This is what we would like to see because of the whole trend of the red tapes. What advice can you give us and help us to eliminate some of these bottlenecks that when we stand up and say that it is by ILO where we can increase maternity leave, come up with paternity leave, and decrease working hours for parents, because I know in Sweden already they reduce the working hours. What tips, directives can you give us so that we can reach at least close by, maybe not within a year or two, but close by, that we can see more free time for parents to be home? Well, I, I love your both reflection and question. Um, but I'm the wrong person to ask because I would favor that you follow the Swedish example, <laughs> being a Swede myself. But, um, but I do think that actually a society benefits from looking at which are the best examples when it comes to maternity leave and paternity leave. And in the case of Sweden, what they have discovered is it's better to try to spread it out between zero and seven years of age. Because every family is different. So some families, for instance, are able to have the grandmother around. There, there are other arrangements that make it possible for them to use less of the paternity leave. And they do curtains and a number of other things. And they are not, you know, punished to do so much. They work each at their pace. That company has existed now 42 years. The only typical staff are occupational therapists, cooks, support staff that makes it possible to them function. Now, not only that. The company also provides food for all of them. And they have to provide that food in 15 different forms, depending on whether they can cut the food or they cannot cut, or even they have to suck it. Not only that, the company has built apartments for all of them. And you would love the apartments if you see them. Not only that, so many are having such quality of life that they are now living beyond 80 years of age. And persons living with mental conditions and syndromes seldom live that long because of the lack of dignity by which they are treated. And they have built there for a whole wing with a clinic with a permanent nurse there, all paid for by the company. And they are still having a yearly turnover of about $12 million. So it's a question of how do you want to use your head? As employer, are you interested only in enriching your own pocket? Or do you want to create a model of a company? And why couldn't we have a few model companies for the world here in St. Martin? There's no need, no reason why not. Here in St. Martin, we can put name and surname to every problem. And we should be able to resolve it. So I think work on having a long-term goal, 2030. St. Martin should be the model in the Caribbean and why not in the Americas, you know, in terms of best conditions for its workers. And I don't think you will go broke rather the opposite. So many will want to come and see what you are achieving. But I'm sure the minister would like to add a few comments on this. Well, her, your, your question was how do you get these changes? Well, our system is a very complex system where it has to go through lots of processes. Right now, for example, that particular uh, amendment in the law is at Parliament where it's being discussed uh, the extension of paternity maternity leave as and adding into the law paternity leave and all I can say is advocacy would be important just continue to let it be known and let it be heard and you know as and if you continue consistently you know speaking out uh, on this, eventually you will 
uh, get, see that it will be realized. Maybe not in terms of weeks that you may look for, because, for instance, paternity leave is would be new in our system. But if we could just start with a couple of days, uh, it's a start. Uh, so continue to speak out, continue to advocate it, and I'm sure that you'll be able to make a difference. Yes, I would just like to also uh, add to this discussion. I think this is a very important question. This is something that I had to deal with in my personal life. Uh, I remember being professor at the University of Puerto Rico when my first child was born. And I asked the union, I was a militant in the professor's union, university professor's union, and I said, well, what happened with paternity leave? And I was laughed at, I literally laughed at, like, you know, how could it be ridiculous? What are you going to do? Uh, spend the night more days at the bar, you know, not, not thinking that a father actually has responsibility. Then I moved to the Netherlands. I had my second child. And of course, there I got one day a week free to be at home. Still not enough. I really believe in the Scandinavian model that you have there. But I think that uh, these problems, uh, these bottlenecks, as you have identified, uh, have basically to do with what we call in the social sciences, and nothing too complicated, just basic structural problems of society. And I would just like to suggest that there are through three areas that we need to look at uh, when we want to answer the questions, how can we further the cause for more maternity leave and paternity leave? And that just as one example of many social reforms that we have to do. So what are these three structural problems? One is simply inequality within the kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, St. Martin, country St. Martin, is one of, the, one of the countries in the kingdom of the Netherlands. But we have to recognize there is no equality within the kingdom of the Netherlands. How is it possible that an insurance company will tell me, congratulations, you are covered by Najuko, but Najuko will not cover anything that has to do with diabetes because you have diabetes in your family, therefore you're high at risk. This would be completely unthinkable in the Netherlands. How is it possible that we accept these conditions? So we have to organize to fight for equality. And I think that that's where uh, organizations like the trade unions and the coalitions like the uh, St. Martin Anti-Poverty Platform uh, really need to work on. We have to think kingdom-wide. Whether we agree with being in the kingdom or not, we have to think about what are the rights attained there in the Netherlands and what are the rights that we can achieve here. Huh? Because we should have the same rights that we have in the Netherlands. That's one aspect. Another aspect, I think, is gender. We have to think about the rights of women. Well, women's rights are human rights. And so we also have to contemplate in how our society is organized. Here at the University of Amsterdam, more than 85% of our students are women. And I'm always asked the question, so where are the men? So the men, they're in vocational training. If you go to NEPA, it's the other way around. Most of the students are, uh, are, are men. Uh, the minority are women. Yeah? And, of course, we see the number of youth that are in the, uh, in the, on the streets and run into problems, and they're overwhelming, overwhelmingly men. So something is happening here in the relationship between men and women. And when we turn to talk about maternity leave and paternity leave, uh, then we have to think about the relationship that we have with women. And all this goes back to my third structural problem, is education. Uh, uh, how is it that most of our students here, if not all of our students here in programs at USM, they're all full-time workers. They're working full-time during the daytime, and then they come to the university to study full-time. And then we wonder why we have problems with grades, why we have so much struggle to get more than an associate degree, why we have so much struggle to get to the bachelor degree. Uh, we really have to rethink, and I'm really glad that the minister is on board with us here to think about education, uh, because education is not working uh, on St. Martin. Education is not working, there's a gender imbalance, and we're not talking about equal rights. We need to talk about equal rights within the kingdom. If we take these three things into consideration, I think that we can move forward in promoting 
general rights like maternity and paternity leave. Established for us way, we was, way before we was born, almost 100 years ago, by the United Nations. Now, before we say about equal rights, I totally agree with equal rights in the, within the kingdom. We have to start at home. We have to start treating each other on our level right so that our politicians can see we have allowed division and conquer too long. It is our fault at many times where we have that type of division. Because, for example, I was going to answer for the minister. When a documentation comes in front of the Council of Ministers and Parliament, seeing that it came from a tripartite that consists of the workers' organization, the employees' organization, and the government that tells you it's a tripartite of three healthy organizations that came together requesting a change within the law that can be more humane, that we can solve small problems, allowing parents to be at home with a newborn kid gives more into our society. Because remember, you have three organizations there, which, which represent the employers, employees, and government. And when this documentation reach in parliament, council, and ministers, and they take a long time to debate about it, and depends which minister is sitting there, they are going to back it up, yes or no, they are paying politics with our livelihood with our human rights so we can stand up and say we want the equal rights from the kingdom but if we ourselves cannot stop the bickering and bickering and start dividing and doing the things that we are doing that is wrong how can we stand in front of these persons that's supposed to represent us and make them respect us if we start from at home with your kids, at your family in the workplace. Employers and investments come to St. Martin to invest because they want to make money. We need the job so that we can provide for our families. If we put organizations together, the poverty platform, the Chamber of Unions, the Tripartite, and we keep putting all of these together, and we come up with solutions, we come with suggestions, we exhaust our time, resources that we don't have, limited finances, and when it reach in front of our leaders, and that become a bottleneck that they're going to play game and politics with it, how can we prosper and reach to fight for our rights, equal rights within the kingdom? Me and Dr. Carmona have been discussing how can we develop this project in a way that there will be more involvement of parents, workers, families, but also of the children, the youth, that they can speak out, that they can be better informed, and that they can give a better informed opinion. And of course, this kind of questions will come up. How can we bring change? How can we surpass the bottlenecks that we can pinpoint so well? And the minister asked for that as well. <laughs> yes. And the minister asked that you keep at, at it with this advocacy. So very good. So maybe Mr. Carmona can just give you a little briefing of how as this institution, university, what kind of research that we would like to see? It's not only we are going to do the research and describe what is happening, but we want an active participation so that this development can take place. Can you give a few tips already in which direction we sure. will be? There's a, it, it's very important, I think, uh, for the university to reach out to the community because for many years, for centuries, the university was seen as this privileged place this place of elites. Uh, and so because the university, so, what it did is it served the, 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 the noble, the, king, the, the kings, the, the, the rulers of, of, of the earth. Uh, 
uh, and uh, I think in places like St. Martin, the university uh, had to be a place that had to serve the development of the country. So it has to be a people's university. And at least since my, my vision of where I am right now as president of the university is to make USM the people's university. And so what can we do? Or what, is, what are the plans or what are the, the ideas that we're, we're talking about here? There's something called social action research. Social action research. And uh, social action research is research dedicated to improving the human condition socially. socially. And of course, there is involvement of sociologists, of political scientists, of economists, uh, of different uh, of, of, of researchers and professors of different fields. Uh, but what is particular about social action research is that the people who are most affected uh, by the social problems are the ones who are going to design the questions that need to be answered. Right? And we do this through what you call focus groups. Right? Uh, so that, for instance, trade unions or representatives of trade unions or militants in the trade unions would get together in groups of 20, uh, uh, no more than 20, uh, and talk about what are the main problems? They would identify the main problems. And of course, this would be recorded. And then we would do the same thing with the youth, with the teenagers. And then we'd also have guided discussion with children in the schools. We could do this with teachers. And we do this with communities. And then by gathering this information, recording this information, so what, what the researchers do is they sit down and they listen to the workers, they listen to the teachers, they listen to the children, and they listen to the youth. They listen to the mothers and the fathers uh, to see what exactly are the problems uh, that most people are facing. And from there, the university can say to the government, or the researchers, they could say to the government, look, the people have identified, we have scientifically identified what the problems are, and therefore we could prioritize uh, on what we need to do with legislation. So that's what uh, one of the things that I envision uh, in, this, uh, in this collaboration, uh, social action research. And we put a price tag to it. And we put a price tag. How much is this going to cost? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and then when we have this defined, then we talk to the CFT, Collegia Financiera et Tuzicht, uh, and then we, we battle it out. Uh, Kingdom-wide. But I think the first thing that we do is we define it amongst ourselves first. And that's what, uh, yeah, that's what I would like to see here at the, happen at the university. I would like, because this morning, Mr. Kasper, you said it very nicely. So I would like you to share with my colleagues of the trade union what you told us this morning of we have the floor of rights and what role the university should the university should play in selecting the tiles. So can you share that again, that thought, with my fellow unionists? Well, <clears throat> what generates violence in our societies are disparities. It's not poverty. It's not poverty that creates violence. It's the huge differences that create violence. And therefore, having human rights is actually trying to create a floor below which no one falls. Because once you have big disparities, you are planting the seeds for future violence. Now, this floor of rights as you see here, we have a lot of tiles. One of those tiles is avoiding children that suffer from chronic undernutrition. Another tile has to how we will protect the mother from being sexually abused. Another of those tiles you know, has to do with workers' rights. Another tile has to do with the right to education. 
a child that goes not to a warehouse preschool, but goes to a preschool that helps their development, that child has five times greater possibilities to finish secondary school, high school, than a child that didn't go to a quality preschool. That's another of those tiles. And as a society, we, need, we, we cannot necessarily put all the tiles at the same time, but we need to be clear which are the tiles that are missing, where do we have disparities, who is being left behind, that is, who has fallen off the cliff, hmm, and whom we want to bring back up. Uh, it's the same, you know, when you take a bus. I saw here the buses, they say Marigo or whatever. They say where they are going. You know, you don't go up to a bus and then ask him, where are you going? Hmm? And as a society, we need to know in which direction are we going? Where do we want to be 2030? And between now and then, and I think politically it should be possible because you're looking beyond a single government hmm? and you're trying to go beyond a government. When you're building state responsibility, the government is here. No government lives up to state responsibility. Hmm? Not in Sweden, not anywhere. Hmm? That's why they have a political platform, because they want to improve something so that we get better towards you know, what is real state sovereignty. And uh, we all need to help each other, either by helping the government or by advocating with the government how we will reach. And that is what gradually will build the floor of rights. Too many see human rights as a ceiling that we're striving towards, and it's not. It's the floor of rights that we need to build so that we as human beings don't have some that are living down in the ditch. I have time for one more question, and then we close off. Anyone wants to question the last question <laughs> now but you are going to continue not for one question for more sessions that's why we're here my question is after all this research is done by the research team will this research come with recommendations with our government to respect this and what guarantee we have that we can see a change that come about with this research. Let me tell you that we had a wonderful meeting today. Not only with staff. Wait. Not only with the staff of the university, but also with the representative of government in this area and the SG. And they came also out tonight to meet with you and to listen to this kind of questions that we will be actually collecting more and more because when you have a question, then we can look into it. That's one. I'm not the one that is going to do the research. I just assist the project leader in that way. But what I can tell you is this, of what I get at. Because of these contacts, everybody's looking out of what you all are going to bring in. Because as Dr. Kamona explained, it's not the researchers, it is the people involved addressing their issues, coming up with their wishes, and we trying to put it all together in a way that it can become a contribution to policy, public policy, but also development of our society. I don't know if I said it well, but I know for sure Dr. Kamona, because he is the project leader now, he can tell you if your, uh, your question has been answered. But the minister also I, th I think it's a, a good point that you've made. Um, research, once it's completed and it's published, uh, it's actually community uh, property. 
And I'm sure that recommendations are not only directed to government, but there will be recommendations directed to faith-based organizations, directed to families and parents, and, and so on. And uh, so it's going to be difficult for us to say here we're guaranteed uh, follow-up to an implementation to, to, to the recommendations. But the research and the recommendations will be there, and I'm sure that the various groups uh, to whom these recommendations are directed, we need to encourage them. Just as, you know, we said families, parents, uh, there will be recommendations for, for them. We had a recommendation from Mr. Kas Mrs. Uh, Mr. Kasberg tonight, you know, just 10 minutes of family time, eye-to-eye -eye conversation. Can you guarantee that? But we need to know so that there will be some parents in the course of time who will adopt uh, those recommendations and government will adopt recommendations and uh, the other groups in our society, they will with time adapt. But it will take people like you to remind the, the government and to remind the people that these are for the good of our society if these recommendations are executed. So continue the advocacy. We want to thank you for coming out tonight. We want to especially thank the recorder of tonight, Mr. Ricardo William, Orion Productions. Thank you so much. Because each one of you, going back to your labor union, to your setting, can get this video so that together with the rest of your organization, you can start the discussions. And we would gladly organize and structure with you that interaction, that this information can be brought together and that we can continue this research in action. May I thank you all for coming out tonight and for sharing with us. May I have a special thank you for the guest speaker, to our minister that especially had such warm words for all the parents and especially with the eye to the youth the children, and then also our president of the university, providing us with the facilities. Dean also very thanks for uh, supporting us in this endeavor. And then uh, last but not least, co-coordinator. You see, they're thanking us for organizing this. It is a start. Uh, we would like to see one year from now what is the result and what we have achieved.